Well, welcome back, everybody. And uh, if anything is, uh, if we have evidence from this last session, I know that everyone is very um, engaged and I'm looking forward to all of your questions. And so make sure you kind of take notes and bring a lot of that intellect that's in this room to this, to this um, portion of the, of the agenda. I'll introduce myself real quickly. I am Mika Sales. I'm the Director of Special Initiatives at the Duke Endowment. And within my role at the Duke Endowment, I get to do a very exciting thing. And I think it's actually, it's very incredible work that's going on in Guilford County. And I dare, I dare say it might even be historic. And I think in general, we all are in a historic moment and we've heard about this opportunity that is afoot and that the movement around early childhood is really um, pronounced as we can tell from yesterday's great event um, that, was, that was put on by, the, by this policy conference and as well as what's going on around the country and what's going on in our own state. So I get to, to the opportunity to work with this great group of people. Um, some of them are sitting here and then there's others in Guilford County that are doing historic work. So there are about 6,000 children born in Guilford County every year. And the work that is, um, I'm speaking about is known as the Get Ready Guilford Initiative. And it's led by uh, the backbone organization, Ready for School, Ready for Life. And what they are doing is trying to ensure that every child and family is receiving equitable access to quality supports and services so that their children are prepared when they enter kindergarten and that they are successful at third grade. So there are dozens of community leaders working in Guilford County. And um, just today, I've just got a few key leaders that are here today that are really gonna talk about and bring some of the work to life. And they're really gonna talk about what the work is all about, who it's all for, how it's getting done, and how, we're, how we are measuring it. So I'm gonna introduce them quickly. And then we're going to have um, a presentation by Sharice Hart, who's the CEO of Ready for School, Ready for Life, to kind of give you an orientation of what the work is all about. I have different questions for each of the panelists that are gonna highlight some aspects of the work. We're gonna talk a little bit, um, I have an opportunity to share any lessons learned, and then we'll take your questions. Sound good? All right, so I'm just gonna go in alphabetical order here. I guess, and, and it just happens that we'll be right on the edge there. So Ryan Blackledge is uh, the Director of Government Affairs at Cone Health, a not-for-profit healthcare network serving people in Alamance, Forsyth, Guilford, Randolph, Rockingham, <laughs> and surrounding counties. He has been at Cone for seven years, and prior to Cone Health, um, he worked as a, an attorney for the NC General Assembly. We also have Ken Dodge. This, my, my sheet's kind of in order in the way that you all sat. We have Ken Dodge, and you all know Ken Dodge, so I don't need to give much more of an introduction to Ken, <laughs> other than that um, his, in, his um, contributions to the Get Ready Guilford initiative are, are very um, significant. We, the endowment has a long relationship with um, supporting and developing Family Connects, and Ken is, is um, helping with the key aspect of the work in Guilford County, as well as um, helping to support some of our efforts around measurement and evaluation. Um, Sharice Hart is the CEO of Ready for School, Ready for Life, and um, she is, is the backbone leader of this um, enormous effort, and she'll tell you more about the effort as we get into the presentation. Um, I skipped over Sana Sharif in order, and Sh Sana Sharif is a community organizing and family issues facilitator. Um, she's also on staff at Ready for School, Ready for Life as one of the first parent liaisons. So that's a new strategy that's being deployed by the backbone. Um, she has been part of the Guilford Parent Leader Network. She serves on the steering committee and she's made contributions to the Ages 3 to 5 design group with a concentration on social emotional learning. And beyond Ready Ready, Ms. Sharif serves as a co-host co -host of the New Neighborhood Podcast which is centered around creating safe spaces for children and supporting their families. And she is an active um, community volunteer. We also have Ed Kitchen, who is the um, co-chair of Ready for School, Ready for Life. He's also a former city manager of the city of Greensboro, and he is the chief operating officer at the Joseph um, Bryan Foundation. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Sharice, and then we'll get into our discussion. Do you want to stand here, Sharif? Okay. How about this? Okay. All right. Well, 
good morning, everyone. Um, really excited to share about our strategy to build a system of care at Ready for School, Ready for Life. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, so Ready for School, Ready for Life actually was founded in 2014 by Ed Kitchen and Susan Schwartz um, as a very small initiative with a very bold mission. Um, and our mission is a collaborative effort to build a connected, innovative system of care for Guilford County's youngest children and their families. And that tiny idea and that bold mission continued to grow year over year over year. Um, the organization started with just one full-time person and a half-time staff person, and now we have a staff of 20 individuals um, today. Um, we are a standalone 501c3 organization, and again, our mission is bold, and our aim is population-level change. And as we heard earlier, it is hard work, but we're going to share with you how we're addressing this hard work later. Um, we break down our, our work in two phases. Phase one is focused and centered on serving children pre or, or parents and families prenatally to age three. And then our second phase of the work will focus on ages three to eight. All right, so we can go to the next slide. So the big question is, why are we doing what we do? And it is because we want to ensure that every child is prepared for kindergarten in Guilford County. And that is a challenge, as you can see here with our data. Um, and this is based on what we call the DIBBLES data, or Dynamic Indicators for Basic Early Literacy Skills. It's the best um, assessment that we have at this point. And you will see in 2015 to 2016 that all students were, 63% of all students were considered prepared for kindergarten. But then that continued to shift and decrease year over year down to 50%, and that was right before the pandemic, and so that impacted our ability to collect new data, so that's where the data stops at this point. But what's even more alarming are the disparities that we see between children of color and white students, and that's why we're doing what we're doing, because we have to close and address these disparities that we're seeing in our community. And um, we have to ensure that all children are prepared for kindergarten, and that's why we're starting prenatally all the way to age three because it starts at the very beginning. Okay, next slide, please. And the reason that we're going all the way up to age eight is because we want to check in on these, on these babies that we're working on or working with at the very beginning to ensure that they have um, amazing math and reading scores at third grade because we know that third grade reading is an indicator that um, is gonna look at high school success and success in life. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so again, we all know this, but 80% of brain development occurs before the age of three. And, you know, when people think of ready for school, ready for life, they automatically go to pre-K, which is important. We value pre-K, but we are very clear that it starts at the very beginning. And so the services that you're going to hear about in our discussion today are going to address how we're looking at um, supporting families and children to ensure that they're getting the support that they need. All right, next slide, please. All right, smart investment. Um, so we all hear about the stock market um, and we all hear about what you need to invest in, but we're very clear um, that the best investment is in the early years. And so that's why we started this initiative, Ready for School, Ready for Life. And so you'll see here um, that, yes, we want to invest in job training and workforce development, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We want to invest in schooling and preschool programs, but the more that we can invest in the early years and in supporting women, children, and families prenatally up to age three, and then shifting that focus to ages three to eight, it's going gonna, it's gonna to yield a higher return. And I, I can't think of a better investment than that. All right, next slide. So for every dollar that's invested, um, it's gonna yield a four to $16 return. And that is from our Nobel Peace, I mean, our Nobel Prize, <laughs> not Peace Prize, but Nobel Prize winning economist, James Heckman. And again, if we can invest in the early years, 
we're going to have a greater return. And that's our goal for Guilford County. Um, you know, Guilford County, as you all know, we are located in the center of the state. And uh, we may not have the finance backing or financial support or the banks that you see in Charlotte. And we may not have the, the RTP <laughs> approach that we see in Raleigh-Durham, but we're a strong community. And we do value our earliest and youngest learners. And so that's why we are investing in them um, because we wanna yield that type of return. All right, next slide. I want to spend some time focusing on equity strategies. Um, ready for School, Ready for Life as a standalone 501c3, we do have the standard board committees. Sometimes I call them the boring committees. Um, but we have the finance committee, the HR and governance committee, the executive committee, and that's important part of a, of an, a fully operating nonprofit organization. But we also have an equity strategies committee and a very active equity strategies committee, and we mean business. And so we are very clear that systemic racism contributes to a lot of these disparities that we see. And in that committee, we have parents, we have leaders of our board, we have staff members, and we meet um, every other month, and we have worked very hard over the last year and a half to develop a very robust equity action plan. And that equity action plan, it is long. Um, it is about 10 pages long, but it's full of information on how we're going to approach racial equity at the organizational level and then shifting that work into the community level. Because if we don't look at equity, I don't think we're gonna be successful in our approach. So we are very clear on that. And um, we're excited about the next phase of our equity strategies work at the organizational level. Next slide, please. So how do we innovate this system of care? I told you about our mission earlier, about our collaborative effort to build a system of care for Guilford County's youngest children and their families. So one, it takes support. Um, and so we have a very close and tight-knit partnership with the Duke Endowment and then Blue Meridian Partners who have invested heavily into our aim to address population level change. We, are, we have also have a host of other funders um, and organizations that have invested their time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears into this work, and we could not do it without them. Um, so right now, phase one um, is centered on a three-year investment from the Duke Endowment focused on prenatal to age three. And we're partnering with the Duke Endowment um, to submit a, or going through a reinvestment process to Blue Meridian Partners to leverage additional support, not for the backbone, but for our community partners to get us to the next phase, which is going to be centered on expanding prenatal to age three and then focusing on ages three to eight. The next part of this is advocacy, and we heard a lot about advocacy in the uh, panel discussion earlier today, and it's important. Um, so I did mention equity strategies, but also equity strategies plays a huge role in our advocacy and public will building efforts. So you'll hear from Ryan uh, Blackledge later about how we're addressing that at the county level and at the state level. But we are very focused on a policy, and we actually have a public policy and legislative action committee um, at Ready for School, Ready for Life. And that ties into our goal uh, to address population level change. And then lastly, engagement. Um, we believe in partnering with Guilford County families. Um, so you'll hear from Sanaa uh, later on in our discussion about how we're doing that. Um, but we also understand that we need to highlight and ensure that uh, community programs are partnering together. So it's a balancing act. Engagement is a balancing act and is not easy, it's hard work but that is a, a key component to our model. All right, next slide, please. And that leads us to our panel discussion today, our priority areas. So when Ready Ready was founded in 2014 as an initiative, we actually pulled together business leaders, parents, families, our board of directors, community organizations together um, through a 100-day challenge. And out of that challenge, they, de they developed a key set of priority areas. And so you'll hear more about our priorities later, but just to highlight them, you're gonna learn more about our navigation system, our efforts to expand and integrate proven programs and evidence-based programs, how we're developing a culture of quality improvement, how we're gonna track all of this amazing information, 
conducting rigorous evaluation, and then again, building public will. So thank you so much for listening to why we're doing what we're doing, and then you're gonna hear how we're actually implementing our strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Sharice. And if you just keep up this last slide real, just real briefly. Again, these are the these are the activities, the priorities of the work in Guilford County. So there's active implementation going on around all of these um, of these elements, and and that is what's bringing that's what's unique, I think, in terms of we talked about coordination at the last panel. So there's there's a backbone organization led by Sharice, also by board of directors, that is ensuring every day that there is tight coordination, there's alignment, there's planning together, there's um, you know, um, choreographed implementation that's happening to make all of these things you know, come to life. And again, I, I think I can speak for, for all of us to say, someone used the word earlier today about um, you know, we're not perfect. Like this is not about, it's not a perfect you know, system right now. It, our, we're trying to build the system of care and there's a lot of um, adaptations that, take, that go along along the way, but we're efforting to try to do um, as best as we can for children and families in Guilford County. So I'm gonna ask Ed, who is um, the co-founder of this um, organization and this effort, to talk a bit about the board. And we, we know we need leadership, and we also have a great CEO here that's leading the organization. There's community leaders in um, leading or other organizations in Guilford County that are contributing to the work. And then there's also, you know, executive leadership at the board, at the board level. So, you know, when you build a backbone like you all did, tell us about the process of um, putting those leaders together, how you brought them together, and what, you know, what type of support um, do they need to lead and be um, ambassadors for this effort and to really um, bring this thing to life in Guilford County. Well, thank you, Mika. Um, <clears throat> so if you'll bear with me for a minute, I wanna go back. You might be wondering, well, how did this get started and why? <clears throat> and uh, I'm with the uh, Joseph M. Bryan Foundation in Greensboro and a former city manager. And uh, <clears throat> my co-chair who could not be here today, Susan Schwartz is with the Seymour Foundation, which is the old Cone Mills money. And both Susan and I were uh, got really interested in uh, what was happening with young children in our community. And there were a number of experiences that we had that drew us to this that said, we've got to do more than we're doing today. And I'm just going to give you a couple of quick examples. Um, so as city manager, um, one of the things that I would do frequently is go out with our employees to see what was going on in the rural world out there. And when I go out with housing inspectors, we talked about housing earlier, I saw some conditions that really bothered me, and not just, not just for the families that were living in those housing conditions, but when I saw children, innocent children in those housing conditions. We talk about ACEs. Uh, there were a number of ACEs situations going on in those conditions, and that stuck with me and that bothered me. Um, when we looked at transportation issues, I was dealing with the public transportation system in, in Greensboro. That was another barrier to it. Another thing that happened was um, the chief district court judge in Greensboro and Guilford County uh, came to me one day at the foundation and said, we need some help with getting something started in the courts. And what his concern was, was that he saw a pattern in juvenile court where if there was a, say, a teenager that was, had gotten in trouble for whatever reason and was in court, and the judges were dealing with them, if they looked out in the audience and they saw a sibling that was a much younger children, they could almost predict with certainty that that child might be in their court system five, 10, eight years from now. So it was a cyclical thing that was going on, again with these innocent children. And then uh, Susan and I and a couple other foundations in the community started looking at uh, math performance of our low performing high schools in the community, invested a lot of money and trying to improve the, the situation for our uh, lowest performing high schools. And um, we did an elaborate study of it. We spent a lot of money over a number of years. And the bottom line was our results were really pretty limited. We were disappointed in the, in the results that we saw and test scores for math and so forth. And when we asked uh, the provost at UNCG, who was the evaluator for the effort, why is this, um, his response was, was 
almost immediate. He said, you started way too late, mm -hmm. that you've got to start earlier. So those are some examples of things that piqued our interest in this. So we started, uh, as Cherie said, putting together um, some community groups. It was a very informal um, organization. Um, Susan and I were basically staffing it from our positions in the foundations. And we got a lot of people together. Um, we had um, David Lawrence, uh, that some of you may know from Florida, who leads the children's movement there, come and speak to a group of business leaders. We had Nathan Fox, if you know uh, Jack Shonkoff at Harvard. Nathan is one of his colleagues at the University of Maryland, and neuroscientists come and talk about brain development to the business leaders. And we even had uh, Governor, former Governor Hunt come and talk to the business leaders. And they left that, that meeting that we had for them, and basically they, say, they said, we're convinced something needs to be done. We understand the brain development issue. Now, what do we do? So Susan and I didn't quite know what to do, and so we started gathering more groups together, had the big uh, event that, um, that uh, Sharice mentioned uh, before, had about 400 people show up for the event. What we didn't know was our now colleagues at the Duke Endowment happened to be in the audience. They were looking for somebody to invest in. And a long, long story that uh, I won't go into right now, but they ended up investing in us along with their uh, colleagues at the Blue Meridian Partners. So suddenly we had a lot of money, um, maybe not enough money to solve this, uh, this big, big problem that we've all got, but we had a lot more money than we, th we ever did before. And so we had to form an organization that could handle that, that could, could do a good job with a mission that we had. We created the 501c3, and then we went out and said, we need leadership for this beyond Susan and I and a few other people that were actively involved. And so we went out and reached out into the community for a board of directors that could manage this uh, process. Um, and we started out with about 20 in that group. I will tell you that we went initially to get folks who had sort of instant credibility in the community. So there were folks like the chancellor at North Carolina A&T State University. Some of you may know Harold Martin. Um, we went to the uh, head of the United Way. Uh, we went to the county manager. Uh, we went to uh, some county commissioners. Um, we went to the head of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the, the president of, or the elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. We went to the school superintendent um, to give us some instant credibility um, on the part of leadership and to bring in some of the collaboration that's necessary in this work. Talked, talked about collaboration earlier. And we put that group together, and they have been stalwart uh, leaders of this effort ever since. What we have done since then is, is we've expanded that board, uh, one, to become more diverse, um, although we had a lot of diversity at the beginning, but more diverse in a lot of different ways. An example of that is sitting next to me, <laughs> Sanaa here, who is a parent leader. Uh, she was originally on the board. Um, and then when we uh, decided to fund some positions for family members that could, uh, could help with work on a regular ongoing basis, uh, Sana stepped up and is, we're just delighted to have her in that role now. Uh, we've done, uh, we, in our board recently, we decided that um, some of us, uh, like myself, uh, I won't talk about Susan, but I'm, I'm, I've got white hair here. I'm not a real young guy anymore. We started looking at the age. I've got grandchildren, but I don't have children under the age of eight. We now have a, a guideline that we're looking for a third of our board members to be parents with children under the age of eight. Um, so we're trying to look at um, diversity from a variety of perspectives, not just the typical ones that you look for, race and ethnicity, but also who are we really re representing and who are our who are our patients, our customers, who are the folks that are really on the ground that are dealing with this, so we've got that input into the system. Um, I'll, I'll mention that, of course, we had to start, because of the amount of funds and the number of priorities that we've got, we had to start staffing up. We were absolutely delighted to find Sharice, who uh, has a strong background uh, in this space in her career. She's super talented, super bright, and more than anything else, um, I like to refer to her last name, Hart. She's got heart. She's got passion about this work. And she thought we thought she would be the perfect choice, and she's turned out to be. 
and now she has um, hired a number of, of staff that uh, are, have expanded from an original two or three that we had uh, up to about 20 now. So we think we've got the right board leadership in place, we've got the right staff in place, and now we're reaching out to others, um, other stakeholders in the community to try to, to bolster that going forward. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that gives you an idea of kind of why we got started and where we are now in terms of governance of the, of the entire effort. Great. I, I think um, what, what's really compelling about your comments, Ed, is that you all sensed, you sensed a problem. You even maybe saw a generational problem from your mm -hmm. vantage point as a, a city manager. You all looked at data, and then you, you, got, into, you got into action. And um, I think one of the things that you all did early on, too, that the endowment was very um, impressed by was the intentionality around family voice. And, um, and that even area has expanded. So Sanaa, who is now um, a parent liaison on staff at Ready Ready, talk to us a bit about, um, about the family voice and the experience. I know you, were, you and I were chatting back and forth yesterday on, on, the, on the conference, so there was a lot of good content around family engagement, family voice, centering families, listening to families, believing what they tell us. So can you talk a bit about um, how that's being, how your work is contributing, how your leadership as a parent is contributing to the efforts in Guilford County, and what are the, some of the ways that can be improved? Um, what I'll start with is uh, Ready Ready offers a lot of opportunities to parents. There are opportunities to join the Guilford Parent Leader Network. Um, also the All Parent Leader Network, which is by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Uh, there are opportunities to join the steering committee. There are board leadership opportunities, as Ed just mentioned, board committee opportunities, um, organizational task force and work groups, um, and Ready Ready constantly creates leadership opportunities. Parents are offered a stipend for their time. Um, overall, parents feel valued uh, by that stipend and by the considerations for what time parents should meet. Um, it was mentioned earlier, some parents work, some parents don't. But, you know, work is done to determine what works for all families. Uh, my personal journey has included, as Sharice mentioned, work on the age, or sorry, as Mika mentioned, work on the ages three to five design groups. Um, the Guilford Parent Leader Network. I joined the steering committee. I served on the Ready Ready Board of Directors, as Ed mentioned, and on the Finance Committee. It was not boring. <laughs> I attended the Board Leadership Academy, which is also extended to parents so they can move into leadership positions. And now I'm on staff as a parent liaison. I serve on the Governance Committee currently and the Legislative Action Committee. Um, I've learned that there are just a lot of opportunities available. Uh, through the Center for the Study of Social Policy, I was trained on the Kofi model. Kofi is community organizing and family issues. I learned about setting personal goals and goals for my family and then goals for my individual community and then goals for the larger community. It's very great work that we're doing. We've trained a phase one and a phase two who is now working in the town hall phase to do some legislative action. Go team. Um, <laughs> there are... Um, well, I said this already, there are leadership opportunities being created regularly, right? So um, as staff is created, as uh, more groups are created, families are brought in and asked what they need and what is needed is being created. Um, I believe that what could be improved is it's work that's being done. It's work that's going to take a long time to be uh, sustainable because some things are really new. But as long as Ready Ready continues to meet families where they are, um, for example, there was a discussion yesterday about not lumping families into the same category. Everybody's circumstances are different. When um, data is collected, circumstances are evaluated, and people are met where they are, I think that it, that is sustainable. Um, it's a continuous learning process, continuing to respond to parent voice, uh, continuing to provide stipends for parent voice. Um, that is kind of along the lines of what the economy looks like at the time, yeah. right? Um, bringing a decision to be intentionally anti-racist is very important. Uh, 
I believe that continuing to create staff positions for families to close the wage gap in an equitable way and kind of avoid that financial cliff is extremely important, especially when creating positions for families um, to join the Ready Ready staff. Continuing to support the manifesto for race equity and parent leadership and continuing navigation efforts and um, I would say directing families to resources for their specific needs, as I mentioned, is very important. So I'm going to put my notes aside. But overall, I believe that Ready Ready is doing a great job at meeting family needs and at improving the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Sanad. <laughs> So bridging over to you, Ryan, um, you know, when we think about systemic approaches, there are areas that Ready Ready has um, been active in and has great expertise. And, you know, you have to also bridge to what we're hearing from families and translate that into actionable policy that is meaningful to families. So can you tell us about, um, you know, this work requires, doing this type of work requires working across a number of organizations. You kind of have to you know, rally all the troops. And you have to confront issues of tur turf, work processes, competition in some cases. How are you all leading this in Guilford County? How are you tackling this and um, gaining some traction? Yeah, so this, um, uh, sorry to use a, a, a word that someone said they didn't like uh, earlier, but collaboration. <laughs> um, and and I, will, I, I will note as an aside, when we, when we attend these conferences, I, I, I feel like, Words like, um, you know, eliminating, or fra words and phrases, eliminating silos, partnerships, collaboration um, in healthcare, social determinants of health. I feel like there are things that we have been talking about for a very long time, and I appreciate the question. Um, was it Phil from, from Duke? Yes, yes, uh, yellow bow tie buddy for the day. Um, <laughs> you know, it seems like we, we've been talking about these ideas for a very, very long time, and I really, really like what Ready for School, Ready for Life is doing to actually make these things happen. Uh, I want to put a double underline under what Ed was talking about earlier with the engagement in the business community. Earlier on, there was the comment, you know, oh, we need to get the corporate world more involved with this. Well, that's really where this started. And it comes from a standpoint of recognizing that Everything that we do has an impact on other parts of our lives. You know, if, if all we're focusing on is early childhood education and not also talking about being ready for school and then readiness for high school and readiness for work and then when you're working you need a place for your kids to go and really understanding how all of this allows a community to be successful together. I mean, that's that's what I think really contributed to the buy-in with the business community. And with the business community t talking about workforce, that's where we got a lot of buy-in, I think. And that has made a lot of our, our advocacy um, uh, uh, much, well, I won't, I won't say easier, but the fact that we can go to business leaders and say, hey, we need you to place a phone call to, you know, whether it's Senator Phil Berger, who's head of the North Carolina Senate, or, 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 or someone else, that has had a, a tremendous impact on our ability to do this. Um, I, I also want to emphasize, you know, you asked about all these government community-based organizations. Uh, something else that Ready for School, Ready for Life is, is doing in this approach is it's trying to build the system as opposed to impose the system. So it's not a bunch of po uh, policy folks going into a back room and saying, all right, what's the best way to do this? And then walking out into the world and saying, look at this wonderful thing we created, and then acting surprised when the entire world didn't applaud and immediately adopt it. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of the old way of doing policy work. And, and, and I really, really like that Ready for School, Ready for Life, you know, when, when we're working on the integrated data system project, which still has, you know, I think, maybe five years to go, um, working on it. It started with the meeting of, hey, parents and families, what do you need out of an integrated data system project? Next steps are going to the area um, 
area nonprofits to say, you know, hey, you're doing an after school program, you're running a food bank, what kind of data would you like to have? Oh, that's data that we could provide to you. Would you be willing to share this data in because that will help this after school program over here? That's the kind of sort of ground up building of the system that I think is, is something that Ready for School, Ready for Life has, has really, really done well. So a lot of that community support makes the advocacy easy within the area. Um, uh, and, and I do want to talk about a, a few particulars of, of some of the advocacy that we've done, just some particular tactics that, that I think uh, could be helpful to folks. Um, you know, of course, there's the sort of the, the, uh, the standard things you have to do. You need to have local champions. Uh, shout out to Ashton Clemens over there, Representative Clemens, tremendous, tremendous supporter of what Ready for School, Ready for Life has been trying to do. Um, so, you know, you've got to have your, you know, your champions, you've got to have your newsletters to keep people up to date, you've got to have your meetings with, with elected officials. But I, I want to highlight just two particular tactics that I think um, we did really well in, in what we were doing. Just, just here, here's a little take home uh, to, to jot a note on. Um, first off, we had an FAQ list. This was not a public FAQ list. This was a, when our volunteer advocates had a meeting with a legislator, these were the questions we got. So there were things like, oh, well, I heard there was this uh, childhood study that proved early education doesn't actually make a difference. Okay, what was that called? All right. And we take it, we do research on that, and then we build that FAQ for internal use for our advocates so we know what those questions are. Legislators talk to each other, and so they're going to have common questions. So we were able to be better prepared for those, have responses, and, and have not just, uh, oh, gosh, well, that's, I don't know, but actually have um, really, really solid responses and detailed information we could, we could send to legislators. Um, Another little little nugget from what we did that I think worked really, really well is we we looked at who the who the influencers, uh, potential influencers, potential detractors were for the work that we were doing. You know, I know a lot of times if you're working in an area, it's like, oh, who else in early childhood education can we tell tell about what we're doing so they can also be supportive of what we're doing and we can support what what they do. Very, very important, and we've had some great meetings with some other organizations throughout the state. We also stopped and, and said, okay, where are we gonna have a roadblock? And when it comes to asking for things like funding, you know, what are other areas in government that are competing for funding? We identify them, we go to particular legislators. Um, and so even though we had a legislative um, money request for HHS budget, we spent time going and talking to folks in education so they could understand, oh, this is an investment that will pay off in your area. Uh, we talked to folks in public safety, justice and public safety to say, hey, if we do a great job with kids zero to three, you're gonna have to spend less money on prisons in the future, we hope. Um, and really kind of making those ties. Um, but, uh, I mean, we looked at, at statewide organizations and really then kind of went around and said, you know, who do we need to tell about this so that when it comes up, they're like, oh yeah, Guilford, Ready for School, Ready for Life. I've heard about that. That's a little bit outside what we regularly do, but I can see how what they're doing in Guilford County can have a benefit to the entire state, the entire nation, and to my area of interest uh, when we're looking 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Um, so with, 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 with that, I uh, look forward to, to folks' questions, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it, it, it does take a lot of um, convincing, right, and just putting, reframing data for people to understand how they can be advocates and, and be involved in the work and really supporting what we're trying to do for children and families. So that work is really critical, and it's an important component of, um, of the model of that Ready for School, Ready for Life is deploying. Sharice and Ken, I'm going to come to you all now. So Sharice, um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, this building the system of care. Like, so right, you know, Ryan said it's not being imposed necessarily, but there is some new things that are happening in Gopher County. Um, and there's a new way of organizing services so that it does create the system of care. So will you... Give us a little bit more content around that. And then, Ken, I want you to talk about also how we're measuring that and how we are 
aspiring for this population level change and how we're going to arrange our evaluation to do that. Sure. Thank you, Mika. Um, so as Mika stated, we're, as a backbone organization, the question I always get or um, I'm asked to respond to is, if there are over 700 nonprofit organizations in Guilford County, and many of those serve families and children um, in a way that's supposed to improve their well-being, why did we start another nonprofit organization? And so as a backbone, we are very clear that we are not in the business of launching a new program, but instead we are building a collaborative or a collective of programs and designing a new service. And that new service is called our navigation service. Um, it's, it's just a navigation service. And so what we are doing is ensuring that we are making it easier for our parents and families. Um, my background, my previous life, I was a social worker. And I can tell you there's nothing more heartbreaking than when you are working with a family and, ch or, and children. When you make a referral and they call me back and tell me that that organization then made another referral and then there's another layer of referrals and then all of a sudden you may not hear from them again or they just become overwhelmed and they give up. Are we really helping families or are we hurting them and are we harming them? And so that's why we've designed this navigation service to ensure that we are helping families navigate the complex system of resources in our community. And I can tell you, it is a great opportunity, but it is a challenge. And let me tell you a little bit more about why sometimes it can be a challenge. Um, so as a social worker, um, you're trained, you're hired for an organization or to do a job. You do your program and your job is to serve a client or families and children and again to help them um, succeed in whatever their goal is. But you're often trained that your program and your program only is the best program and that, that your, your program is going to be the one that's going to save them. And that's just not true. And so what we've done at Ready for School, Ready for Life is that we've built this collective of evidence-based programs, uh, Family Connects, Healthy Steps, and then Nurse Family Partnership. We bring them together and we're integrating their services in a way that strengthens the network for parents. And I can tell you those conversations at the beginning weren't very easy. You have to bring, bring leaders of those programs together and actually have them say that they have certain focus areas and components of their programs and goals of their programs, but they can't do it all. And that's a hard conversation and it's something that they have to face. But it's, uh, it's also eye-opening and it's also a great opportunity to build, to break down some of those barriers and to actually have them learn, you know, what program A is doing well and what they're not doing well and collaborating with program B and then program C. And I can tell you that's the most powerful thing that we've accomplished in our navigation service build. Um, and then on top of that, our goal is to again start prenatally working up to age three. And so we have identified 16 OBGYN practices that we can partner with in Guilford County because we have 6,000 children that are born in our community every year. And it's our goal and population level change to reach all of them. Now that's a challenge. But we've identified 16 OBGYN practices in our community, and I'm very proud to say that we have built um, collaborations with 13 out of those 16 OBGYN practices. So we will have a navigator embedded in 13 OBGYN practices in our community so that when an OBGYN is serving a mother-to-be and that mother-to-be needs some additional resources, they can go on to do what they do best, which is serving patients. And they can call in a navigator to provide resources and a, serve as a guide for that mother-to-be so that we're not just passing them on to another organization and then they get another referral. They'll have that navigator that can be their advocate, their guide, their um, accomplice, and whatever it is that they um, need to succeed. Um, so that's one thing that I'm very proud of. And so we have a navigation steering committee that Ken will talk a little bit more about in um, the next question. But also, um, the next layer of navigation includes our continuous quality improvement model. So another question I receive, and Ryan did uh, mention the 
FAQs. We do have a lot of FAQs because we are a new young organization. But the question that I receive is, well, what about me? I'm not an evidence-based program, but I'm still doing important work in the community. What, do I not make a difference? You know, how, do, how can I be involved in your efforts? And we do say that they are very important. And some of those key programs include like WIC or CDSA or the adolescent parenting programs. Um, and so how do we bring those together in, to, in addition to our, our core evidence-based programs to provide additional support? And so our c continuous quality improvement program, or we call it CQI cohorts, um, work with um, UNC Chapel Hill and the National Implementation Network and the School of Social Work to provide coaching to these programs um, and their staff so that they can be prepared for the influx of referrals that they're going to receive. Um, because we just can't continue to provide referrals for the 6,000 children that we plan to serve and then not support other organizations and programs in our community. Um, and so it is our belief that you have to continue um, to improve on your service to clients and to parents and children, um, but also expand and enhance your capacity. And, you know, I believe, um, you know, I'm, I like baseball, but Babe Ruth did say that yesterday's home runs don't win today's games. And so what that means is that you may have done the best thing last year and you may have achieved your goal last year, but what can you do to continuously improve your efforts and your strategies to serve parents, children, and families? You have to keep going, and that's what our goal is for our continuous quality improvement work. Um, and so last year, we estimate that through our evidence-based programs in partnership with our cohort of uh, 10 additional uh, programs in the community that we served approximately 10,500 children um, in Guilford County prenatally all the way up to age three. And so the final, final layer of navigation is how in the world are we gonna track all of this data? Um, so we're often asked, how will you keep up with all this value, uh, valuable information, especially as a backbone that's charged with making population level change? Um, so that's where our integrated data system comes into play. And so the system that we're designing um, is gonna serve a couple of purposes. purposes. One. We want to track every child that's born in the community um, and provide them with the unique identifier that's going to allow us to track them from birth all the way up to age eight. We need to know how many touch points have we had, which organizations have interacted with this child and their parents, and does it make a difference when we provide assessments um, on how we're going to measure um, how well a child is faring. Um, we also need to ensure that, again, families are not navigating through this fragmented uh, collection of resources. Um, and then lastly, we also need to make sure um, that we are making referrals and investments in the right organizations. So COVID changed a lot of things for um, our community and, and I'm sure all across the state. Um, and so what happened is that we saw a great need for food and basic need resources. And so as we're making referrals to organizations, we need to track where and to whom we're making those referrals to so that we know where we need to invest so that we can continue to provide support for these programs and the influx of referrals they're gonna receive. So that's just an overview of navigation. It's our biggest project. It's complicated, it changes every day, but I'm really proud of our Guilford County community and our leaders, as Ed mentioned, um, the school system, our county government, um, our evidence-based programs, our business leaders coming together to ensure that we have a product and a service that's going to benefit all children in our community. Thank you, Sharice. So Ken, um, one of the, the goals I think is to evaluate and document our learning and impact so that other communities in the Carolinas or in the country can do this work. And so you've just heard Cherise talk about a lot of what's going on, but what is, what is the it that is going to be evaluated and what does it mean to demonstrate impact? And what will it mean if we cannot demonstrate impact? Such easy questions. Um, thank you, uh, thank you all. I, I wanna tell you, I am so lucky and very grateful to be a part of an initiative that has such audacious goals with such talented people in leadership. And I'm not overstating. Uh, this vision is as breathtaking and groundbreaking as 
public school universally was 200 years ago for children age 7 to 16, but now for children 0 to 8. And just think about it in that kind of magnitude. Um, the initiative is committed to measurement, committed to evaluation. Um, like the rest of the initiative, even the evaluation and measurement planning is community-led. Right? We had a task force that got input. And I'm going to say we, and I, and I hope the folks in Guilford will accept me saying the word we as an adopted member of the Guilford community. So I'm going to go ahead and say we. Um, we had a task force that got input from parents, educators, leaders, stakeholders, um, and we concluded uh, that evaluation and measurement must follow several principles. So I'll just tell you the, the general principles. First, we're going to be accountable and evaluate the population impact, not just impact on whatever numbers of children who participate in a program, but the population, which means reaching everybody has to be part of the goal, right? Along with that, we're gonna be held accountable for